Welcome to the world according to Garf. That's G-A-R-F, as in Garfinkel. Howard Garfinkel, as in basketball. In the big business, high-pressure world of college basketball, there are those who contend that Howard Garfinkel is the E.F. Hutton of the sport. When he talks about a recruit, a room full of coaches will fall silent and listen. Here at Garf's five-star camp in the Poconos, he's done a masterful job of bringing together the investors, those college coaches around the country, with the commodities, the cream of the crop of the young basketball talent in America. On this edition of Sports Scrapbook, we're going to examine the world according to Garf. Pocono Mountains in northeastern Pennsylvania are a year-round vacation spot, famous for snow skiing, water sports, honeymoon havens, and for the past 18 summers, basketball. That's when Howard Garfinkel moved his five-star basketball camp to Lake Bryn Mawr near Honesdale. The nationally known camp, whose slogan is, the camp for the better player, has attracted 12 sold-out summers of better players. Credit must go to Five Stars program director and founder, Howard Garfinkel. All right, you've been, uh, you've been good. You've been good at stations, but you haven't been great. Why haven't you been great? Because you're not outworking the coaches. For stations to work, for stations to be fantastic here, every kid must outwork a 35, 40-year-old coach. It took me six months, about six months, to put the staff together and to do these stations, to make sure that, that they were uh, the right ones, with the right coaches, for the right kids. We'd like to know now, so far this week, what do you think of the stations? Do you like them? Yeah. Well, the, the camp began as an idea. When I, when I was a youngster, my, my folks had a little bit of money, and they would send me to an eight-week camp in the summertime up in uh, New Hampshire. And at that time, I got the first bug, the age of maybe 14 and 15 and 16. And then I was a counselor at this eight-week all-sports camp for many years. And I always wanted, I always thought I could run a camp better than the guy that was running it when I went there, the gentleman. And uh, I always wanted to own my own camp. But I found out when I became a young adult that it took a lot of money to own the land and the property, anywhere from 200,000 in those days to a million, a million and a half today. So instead of doing it that way, we rented out an eight-week camp one year in 1964, myself, Willie Klein, and Roy Rubin, and we started the basketball camp, a one-week fun in the sun, have a little, have a few laughs, we'll bring some high school coaching friends of ours, We'll teach a lot of basketball, have a great time for a week. Maybe we'll make a few dollars. We must have done it right because the following summer, we started with 51 kids the first year. The following year, we had a 90, almost double. And the following year, 140, I think the number was 147, 157. It grew like that all the way up the line. It wasn't anything that was planned. You don't plan something like this and say, we're gonna, we're gonna have this. This is something that grows. The original idea was Howard was only thinking of the kids. He loved him, he's a basketball freak and so forth, but he liked to do something for the kids. And it started out inconspicuously, but then as you can see how it has grown and mushroom now. He has his camps in Pittsburgh and here. And so he's benefiting really everybody. He's benefiting the kids, benefiting the coaches, and then finally, last but not least, benefiting Howard also. The hard work paid off, and for 19 summers, Garf has run five-star basketball camp. Unlike some other summer basketball retreats, five-star attracts schoolboy cagers from across the nation. This summer, Kurt Portman, a 6'9 junior standout, 
traveled almost 800 miles from Sheboygan, Wisconsin to enroll at the camp. Well, my coach does all the, finds all the cans for me and just tells me about them and fills me in. And if I like, if I like what he tells me about it, I come, usually come to it. We explained to them that if a kid comes to Five Star, he will get three things that he cannot get in any other camp in the country. He can get one of these or two of these in a lot of camps. He cannot get all three of these, and they are the three most important factors for a rising senior going into a senior year, or even a younger player. And as you know, we have 100 rising freshmen and sophomores here this week. Those three things are competition, exposure, and instruction. Back, back, that's it, that's it. Good, good. Next group, here we go. Nice, nice. Good job, good job, guys. Way to pick it up, way to pick it up. Next group, here we go. We avoid the mismatch. We avoid the switch and the mismatch. Okay? All right. Okay, that's the defense against the screen. The next thing we're going to set up here is how to set a screen off the ball. The main thing I think is to come up here and play basketball, but also to come up here and, uh, you know, learn more about the game as like a science instead of, you know, just fun, running up and down the court, you know, how to play defense a little bit more better, you know, and uh, would you say, um, uh, run up and down, stop running up and down the court and just doing nothing, looking around. Some people just stop and look around with, you know, it's not really a good thing. And coach look at you and say, oh, he's a good player, but he doesn't want to run up and down the court at all or nothing. So you come up here and just play basketball. That's what it's for. Currently an assistant basketball coach at Lehigh University is a former five-star camper. Joining the list of more than 70 former campers, currently coaching on the college and professional levels. Well, I, I can remember some of, the, some of the big names that I had to go against and, uh, and, and the pressure that you feel uh, going against these types of players. It, it's a new experience. Uh, a lot is thrown at you in a short period of time. Uh, and I think a lot depends on, on, on how you handle it and, and what you're looking to get out of the camp. I think if you're looking just to come and display your skills, and I think you're making a mistake, I think you should come and get something out of stations and, and learn because the staff that's assembled is, is excellent. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, be willing to test your skills against who are considered the best players in the country. But it's not all fun and games here at Five Star. It's basketball, 10 hours a day for eight straight days. And Five Star attracts more than just the better players. It attracts the college coaches as well. On any given day, more than 60 coaches from schools across the United States can be found on the camp grounds. Their entree is somewhat restricted, however, to those colleges that subscribe to a national scouting service, High School Basketball Illustrated. To elaborate, in the spring of this year, Howard Garfinkel, then the owner of HSBI, as it is known in the industry, sold the service to a colleague in order to comply with a January 1983 NCAA rule which prohibited college coaches from working at camps associated with a scouting service. The coaches are still present, and Garfinkel says he has disassociated himself with the service which he began in 1965. But spectator spots at Five Star remain reserved for HSBI's customers. Garfinkel claims that he has to restrict entry to the grounds in some manner or every college coach in the nation would be crowded into the courts. He could very well be correct. On the second day of camp at June's Honesdale campsite, more than 60 coaches were studying the merchandise evaluating. They were present everywhere. I've talked to some of the old vet coaches and they said, oh, this is a good group, but they have better camps too with even better talent. Now, the kids that I had in Mississippi, and this is picky in what you know, and not everybody says, where, what? But we had a pretty good little team. They're all sophomores and juniors, and I think a couple of them could have played in the NCAA group here and done all right. But I've seen so many, you know, in the NBA group. I said, my gosh, you know, these kids are going to still another year of high school. They can play college right now. Mm -hmm. 
It's a lot of talent. You know, we look for talent, obviously, and the attitude, Jim, you know, which kids are good kids, and we talk to the coaches that coach the kids. We don't talk to the kids. That's, you know, not allowed, but try to find out what type of person he is and, you know, athletic ability, combination of both. We know players before, and we follow their progress here, so we can see how well they'll how well they'll do, how they handle, you know, when they lose. Because some of the players are 22 and 0 each year, 22 and 1. How they handle losing situations. So the whole big picture is really helped here. You can't talk to the kids, which is excellent, which is the way it should be. But with us, it's so academically oriented school that we have to find out which of these kids are good uh, students. Because we can go watch it and say, hey, that kid's good enough to play for that kid, but none of them can get in. So we have to go through one way or the other, asking and so forth and so on, which kids are good students and watch and look at them. There's so many good players today and there's so many kids playing that uh, I think every school will find somebody each and every year that they had not heard of and will then go on to recruit them for the, for the university. Well, you can see a, a huge number of people in, in, in one or two days. I mean, some coaches will spend a week uh, and if, if your budget is maybe not the same as, as some of the bigger schools. You can see uh, 100 or so kids that you'll, you'll be involved with at, uh, at one time, in, in one day, and it doesn't really cost very much uh, in time or money, and, and a lot's accomplished. The college coaches started coming to Five Star around our third year. Uh, again, we didn't start it out with the purpose of having college coaches come in, even though we had Owens, uh, Owens and Roach in our first camp 19, 20 years ago. They started to come in droves around our third or fourth year, and, and they've just been coming ever since. And, and we get upwards of, uh, we've had a record uh, 232 at one session. Our low in the last 10 years has been about 140. I think we'll uh, mention some coaches now. What is the official number on the second day of camp, Frank? Great. About 60 so far approximately 60 coaches. We introduced some yesterday. Rather than introduce each one, we'd like you to, uh, I'll just mention the name, raise your hand, let these fellas see some of the schools we have here, and at the end we'll all give you a nice hand. There's a lot of guys. Ed Jones of Utica, Larry Cowan of Utica, the very fine head coach of Boston U, three years with the Carolina Cougars of the ABA, John Kuster. Jim Platt from DePaul. It's the first Midwest school that's come through. The, the uh, Blue Demons of DePaul. One of our own resident coaches for 13 years on our staff. We have the uh, very fabulous assistant of Notre Dame. The one and only Pete Gillen. There's, I think, 330 kids this week. Uh, probably over, well over 150 are Division I players, and, and, and you can see them all in a week. You can see them react under different kinds of circumstances. You can look at, at whether they're coachable, you can look at attitude, that type of thing. Uh, I think our job is maybe a little bit different than, than other people, simply because we have to look for the sleepers, uh, the guys who may be overlooked, and I really don't think that anybody here that can play is going to be overlooked. But, but we're here anyway uh, uh, to, to see the local kids, number one, uh, and to see if there's maybe somebody that we don't know about uh, that we would definitely be, be involved with in the coming season. Some of these big kids here will go home and not play against another 6'9 player all year. You know, at this camp they go against one every day. So, uh, yeah, the competition level certainly is uh, better here at Five Star than it will be at home, so it does give you a little better chance to evaluate. Does all this competition and potential exposure breed pressure for the campers? Uh, in the beginning it was pressure, but I figured that it shouldn't be that much pressure since, I, you know, if I come up here and play the way I have been playing and not change it to something that I'm not used to doing, you know, it would be, you know, a lot easier, so I wouldn't think about the pressure. I had fun, but it was, it was high pressure, and, and I, could, I could see guys uh, not react as well as they probably would have liked, but uh, you know, I, I think it's it's a situation where you're going to be playing against these types of uh, individuals in the future, and if you can't handle it here, then you're probably not going to be able to handle it there. I didn't consider myself to be one of the greatest guys, you know, in camp. I was expecting to see a lot of guys, that, you know, seven foot guys and giant monsters, you know, out here to hacking and grabbing rebounds. I didn't expect, you know, what I see now. It's not really what my expectations were. Well, we're not an invitation camp. We're not an all-star camp. We're a teaching camp 
Our first, our first, of the three things that I just told you, the first priority for us is teaching the game of basketball. Out of the teaching comes the exposure to the colleges and the competition. I do a lot of recruiting. I, I spend a lot of time on the telephone explaining what we are to high school coaches who don't know us. You know, most majority of them know us, but not everybody in the country walks around talking about Five Star all day. As long as they're on a high school team, bona fide member of a, uh, an eighth grade, ninth grade, freshman, sophomore, or, va or varsity. Bona fide member in good standing, he can come to the Five Star Camp. Last year I was in the, the it's called the NCAA division. There's NIT for, that's like the development, the younger kids, and then there's NCAA and NBA, which NBA players are all being recruited by major colleges. And last year I was in the NCAA, and I did fairly well. I made the all-star team, and I was, I was kind of getting noticed then. This year I'm in the NBA, and I'm playing against players my size and taller, and it's, it's a, quite a big change. Uh, I was invited back uh, last year, Mr. Garfunkel, uh, at the end of the camp, asked me if I wanted to be a waiter this year, and he'd get in touch with me. And he got in touch with me, and it so happens that I'm going to three five-star camps, this one up in Pittsburgh, and uh, at, in August, right back here. Two of the most celebrated high schoolers ever to come to Five Star arrived under very different circumstances. One came with sneakers, gym shorts, t-shirts, and a national reputation. The other, with very little national reputation at all. The former, 76ers star Moses Malone. I remember Moses very well. I remember the main thing I remember about him, aside from fantastic, incredible play, was Moses did not say five words the entire week. Moses spoke with his talent on the court. He spoke with his intensity, with his attention span, which was excellent. Um, Moses was a waiter, and I remember that he came with a very, very big reputation. He had broken every record in the state of Virginia. And, but, but you have to come and you have to show us here because we, there's a lot of great players that come here with, with big reputations uh, who takes them a half a, a half a week to make their first basket. That's happened. But Moses came and totally dominated the camp in every department, uh, in the games at stations. Even, he even dominated the lectures because all the coaches would pull him out. The other memorable five-star camper College Basketball's Player of the Year, Michael Jordan from North Carolina. You could say he came with no national reputation because he was on no preseason All-American teams, and I don't think there were 10 people outside the state of North Carolina who had ever heard of Michael Jordan. And again, he just totally dominated the camp. He might have been the second most dominating player behind Moses in the history of Five Star. We, and, and, and it's nice to think that, that we were the catalyst for his career. Still, other players have come to Five Star with good reputations, but have a difficult time getting it in gear. An example, Philadelphia 76ers, Mark Ivoroni. He was here as a rising senior. Uh, he was here as a junior, first of all, and he, he absolutely tripped over the lines when he came here. And he came back as a rising senior to the, I think he came to the June session and did not make the All-Star team. And I remember this very well. He did not want to come back. He was booked in for two weeks and did not want to come back to the camp in August because August is a week where, where the talent is even stronger than June most of the time. You get all the city kids in the city. Didn't want to come back. I saw terrific potential in him. And I remember I bribed him. I literally bribed him with a waiter. With a waiter. He did not need a waiter. But I wanted to give him confidence. I wanted to show him that I thought he had a lot of talent. So the way to do that was to offer him a waiter to come for half price, and I did it. And he came, took the waiter, and made the all-star team in August in the toughest session maybe that we've ever had. And I remember he got at least two scholarships out of the camp. One was North Carolina State, and one was Virginia, where he eventually went. So, if a youngster gets the opportunity to enroll at Howard Garfinkel's five-star basketball camp and is fortunate enough to get noticed by the throngs of college coaches who visit, or even just attract the eye of one coach, after the recruiting pitches and campus visits are made, that youngster might be the recipient of a valuable end to his means, a four-year, fully paid college scholarship. 
format of the camp is to have three leagues. NIT for the Rising Sofs, NCAA for juniors and, and weaker seniors, and the NBA for great juniors and better seniors. And a lot of very good, there's a lot of very good uh, seniors in the NCAA this week. We can only put 108 guys in the NBA. We do that to keep the, the, the competition as strong as possible. I'll say that 90% of our NBA, yeah, 90% of our NBA will end up with a scholarship every session, of the camp, no matter where it is. Uh, now, there's a lot of boys in our NCAA. There's a lot of seniors in the NCAA, and that's unfortunate. Uh, that's just our power. That's just our format. I think I would have probably been as recruited the same by the local schools, the big five schools, and, and maybe some schools as far as uh, New England, maybe a little bit down south. But uh, in terms of anything in the West, uh, or anything of the big schools in the Atlantic Coast Conference, it was strictly as a result of this camp. McCaffrey enrolled at Wake Forest, one of those big schools in the ACC, where he had a disappointing freshman year. He transferred to the University of Pennsylvania, where he completed his college basketball and academic careers. Was he over-recruited as a result of a good week at Five Star? Sure, at times I say you can come here and have them come by and check their teeth and their hooves and so forth, but it's what the players want. The kids want this. I mean, they, they won, they're going to improve as players by playing against players as good, if not better, than they are. And two, a lot of them want the recognition, hopefully to get a college a, a scholarship out of it. Well, we're involved in the business of college basketball. Uh, we're here. We're making money on the camp. We're making money on the service. You're making money on Prism TV. Uh, that's, what, that's what makes the world go around. If we didn't make a buck here at the camp, we couldn't run the best camp in the country. We wouldn't, couldn't hire the kind of people that you took pictures of today teaching stations in the most intense manner that you ever saw. The bottom line is, are we doing good or evil? I think uh, he'd be the first one to tell you, and, and I agree with him, and I think most coaches agree that uh, it is pressurized, but it's fair. I mean, everybody's under the same uh, restrictions and constraints. Uh, so, I mean, if, if, if you can prove that you can play against these kids, then I think that you can make that next step uh, at the college level. If you struggle here, I don't think that should be the end of the end of your career, but I think it's an indication that maybe you need a little bit more work, or maybe not a Division One player, maybe a Division Two or Division Three player. In the intense big business climate of collegiate basketball, Camp Five Star is measured as a land of opportunity. From here on, it's up to each individual, the campers, the coaches, and even Garf himself, to make the best of it.